First thing you have to do when entering any industry whatsoever, if you were going to set up a new business, the first thing you would do is do an industry appraisal. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? How's the industry set up? What parameters can I operate in? How do I be successful? What mistakes do I need to avoid? If you were going into any industry, you would do that as a smart business person. Why would you not do it in trading? It's the first thing you have to do. And there's been some major trends in the last 30 years that really affect retail. And they're very important. They have significant consequences. The first one is how the market's set up. Who owns the exchanges? The exchanges is where all the business is cleared. Every time you press the button, it goes, the order goes down a pipe through a broker, through an investment bank, to the exchange. Who owns all the exchanges? Well, there we have it. Intercontinental Exchange, ICE, own NYSE and Euronext. That's the majority of business in the market. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange owns the Chicago Board of Trade, NYMEX and COMEX. So basically we have a monopoly slash duopoly. What does that mean? What do we think it means? Who does economics here? Monopolies, do we like them? What's the negative of monopolies? Hmm? Potentially, pricing, pricing power and control. So we'll, we'll come back to that later, but the exchanges are now basically owned by a couple of companies. And uh, by, by having a monopoly, they can control the market if they want to. How the market is set up, how the players must operate. Who they incentivize. Parameters like this. We'll come on to it later again. Second, technology. Obviously, technology has played a major role in the last 30 years. First things first, infrastructure massively increased retail trader participation. 30 years ago, you'd be on the telephone, calling a broker and just accepting the price on the phone, whatever you got. What have you got now? Well, internet penetration, internet capability, speeds, very low, bar very low barriers to entry. Everyone can trade from their bedroom or their phone. Very easy access. Is that, is that necessarily a good thing? If you have access, does it mean you're good? Of course not. Hardware, microchips, processing speeds, massively increased. And then that's affected the, the uh, penetration of retail traders, much lower cost of production. Again, lower, barri lower barriers to entry. Software, connectivity to financial markets and everything being organized for you. So making life easier. None of it actually means that the trade is going to be profitable. It just means you're supposedly, you're, or you're supposed to have better access and better capability. It's supposed to help you more, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can make money. Regulators. Every problem we've had in the financial markets in the last 30 years, the regulators done nothing to stop it before it's happened. It's always happened afterwards. The regulator is always passive and reactionary in pretty much every geography in the world. So in 2010, one of the main instruments that retail traders use are contracts for difference. They were banned in the United States. Why? Because too many people lost too much money too quickly. Also in 2010, IB contracts, which we'll come to later, does anybody know what IB stands for? If you do, it means you're in the industry and you're on the brokerage side. Introducing broker contract. Introducing broker contract. Are you a broker? Congratulations. You're not going to like this seminar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so IB stands for introducing broker. We'll go into the details on those later. But essentially it means that People introduce retail traders onto the broker's platform and get a kickback for doing so. They were banned in Singapore in 2010. Why do you think they were banned? Why do we think they were banned in Singapore? Because they're great? 
Conflict of interest. Hit the nail on the head. Loads of bad people were turning up into Singapore, like they do all over the world, and teaching people absolute nonsense, putting them on trading platforms, and everyone was blowing up and losing their money. So the regulator government stepped in and banned them. <clears throat> and this is very typical of regulators. They do it after the event. So what does that mean if you're a retail trader? Well, history tells us, as a retail trader, you have to regulate yourself because the regulator is not going to save you. They're passive, reactionary. You'll lose all your money. Then they might change a law afterwards. Doesn't matter. You're done. You're out of the game. Financial markets volatility. Volatility in all the major asset classes since the financial crisis. So 08, 09. So from 09 onwards has been crushed. What does that mean for traders? Sure. So volatility for traders is the lifeblood of a trader. A trader is a slave to volatility. Because without volatility, you don't have any risk and you don't have opportunity. And risk and opportunity are two sides of the same coin. It's called volatility. And if volatility gets crushed, risk and opportunities get crushed which means returns over certain periods of time, over certain time horizons, peter to zero. So why is financial market volatility being crushed in all the asset classes? Well, the first main reason was the monetary policy after the financial crisis. So if you remember, the Fed was implementing QE, quantitative easing. What does that do? Guaranteed buyer of bonds, suppresses yields permanently, that feeds over into other asset classes because money keeps buying other asset classes to chase yield, which suppresses yield. So it goes all the way through the asset classes. Obviously, they stopped a few years ago, but there's other reasons as well. Technology. Why does technology and access for retail traders suppress volatility? Because there's more market participants. Why does more market participants suppress volatility? because it increases liquidity. Why does more liquidity equal less volatility? In most cases. It means there's more willing buyers and more willing sellers at every price for an asset. Which means if you have an infinite amount of willing buyers and willing sellers, assets don't move. Create zero volatility. <clears throat> so this idea of trading now being like it used to be, 15, 25, 35 years ago, where you can just turn up, day trade, and we used to call it scalping, is not existent anymore. It hasn't existed for a good six, seven years. And this is why day traders have basically not made any money or lost money over the last six years. So this, is a big, this has had a huge impact on retail traders because there's, there's less opportunities over shorter time horizons. So the professionals have totally changed their approach in the last seven years. Why? Because professionals do what the market tells them to do, not the other way around. And we get this message through the Institute probably 10 times a week, exactly the same question through the website. And it's literally worded the same all the time. I am a Forex day trader. Can the Institute's education help me? What's wrong with that statement? Why is that? We think it's the most stupid statement or question anyone can ask as, as a trader. Why do you think that is? The person is trying to protect the market. How is going to trade? Exactly. So the person is literally saying, I only trade one asset class and I only trade over one time frame. That's all I do. Now think about it like this. Euro dollar, most liquid forex pair in the market. What's euro dollar done in the last 18 months? 104 to 113. That's been the range. What happens if euro dollar is 106 from now to over the next 250 trading days? And every day you buy it at 106 and sell it at 106. What happens? Can you make money? 
Well, of course not. So this idiot is going to be sitting at his desk for the next 250 days saying, I am a Forex day trader, can the Institute help me? What, what, what mistake has that person made? They've limited their opportunities because they're only trading one asset class, one time horizon, and they don't have any ability to trade anything else over any time horizon. That's the first error everyone makes in retail trading. What you have to do in your first one to two years as a retail trader is to learn how to trade everything and get yourself a proper educational foundation so you can follow the volatility or predict where it is and go where the money is. So if you're over one time horizon in one asset class and it stops working, you can shift and move. You don't define yourself by one asset class over one time horizon. And the only way to do it is to emulate what professional traders do and that's what they've done.